There are things that are unforeseen. You might have done everything well and you have a client who just shuts his doors or gets acquired. You know, not to be negative, but you've got to think, all right, what happens if this goes? Do I have other relationships? You know, where can I go? And just ensuring that no matter what happens, you're never going to be starting from scratch. Asha Rudol. He's worked in recruitment for over a decade. And for the last eight of those, he's been building his career over in the States with Oscar. He joined the business in 2016 to kickstart their contract division. Since 2019, he's billed consistently over a million dollars in GP. And in the last two years combined, he's billed 4.5 million GP. Here's how he did it. Because I always have this argument with my wife. I'm someone I just get up and I just do it. You know? <laughs> I think people make it harder than it needs to be, in my opinion. I think people overcomplicate what we do. This is what you're going to learn in this week's episode. How to bring on large enterprise clients. So I think for me, I always found it easy to go up and then work my way down rather than just go down and work my way up. How to use internal sponsors to open up huge client opportunities. I think it's very difficult to get in any company of a large size without some type of internal recommendation, referral, introduction. The importance of committing to building relationships for the long term. I think people, what they do is they follow the money where it is at the time and it's all present. They're not looking at the long term, the future. Why doing the basics extremely well every single day will result in huge success. You need to know who your target audience is very early on and you need direction straight away. The way you get that is doing the basics extremely well and being thorough. And so, so much more. Let's get into this week's episode. Asha, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. So you're joining me from Tampa. I'm in Tampa right now. Yep. Tampa, Florida, baby. Love it. So we're going to go through, I mean, you've been in the game for over a decade, uh, but more specifically over the last eight years, you've been on this journey with Oscar where you joined the business, um, which was a perm heavy business, uh, which I'm sure is like fair to say. And yep. you've been on this contract journey. So this is another... If any of you listening uh, that's in contract recruitment, this is going to be, I feel, another masterclass on how you can become world class. Hopefully, that's the plan. Right? <laughs> um, so a bit of context for people then. So let me know if any of this is wrong. But am I right? I was just looking at my notes when we were prepared for this. So was, when you joined Oscar, was that on the US journey? Was you already already there? No, that was that was when I moved to the US was with Oscar from the get go from so from day one, joy, uh, moving to Houston, Texas, I started with Oscar at the same time. And then how long have and you've now been around three years in, in Tampa, Florida? Yeah, three years in Tampa, uh, three years next month. And I spent five years in Houston, Texas as well. Nice. So all, all in all been in US full time about eight years. Yeah. And then just some like hi highlights here again, feel free to correct me, but just looking at uh, my notes here. So I think when you joined, there's about six people in 2016 is that on the contract side or just in no, general? the whole company, the whole yeah. company in US. And now there's 70, circa 70. I'm sure that fluctuates. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think what's really cool about this story is that when you joined, it was like IT perm, basically. Uh, and then you've gone on this journey to really build out the the contract side of the business. Um, and then now I was just looking at my notes. How many are in the contract team now? I think across the company, we probably have about 15, 20 mm. people um, that are focusing on it. I think some of those are dual desk. I would say probably about 10, maybe 15 now actually are. Now they're seeing that the benefits of contract are probably focusing on contract 100%. So and then find a bit, find a bit of context. Would you mind just sharing, Asher, like your world? I'm sure there's been like moments where you've done more of some things than others. But what's like your like bread and butter in terms of your niche, your skill set? Like what what does that look like? Just to give everyone context on that front. Sure. So my core is is networking. So network infrastructure, digital transformation. So anything of the core, the five core networking, which is route switch, wireless, data center security. Um, and unified comms and, and voice. Um, and then obviously the different branches within that and anything that kind of connects itself as well. So there's a lot of overlapping with infrastructure. Uh, there's overlapping with areas of virtualization. Uh, and now you're seeing the last kind of five, six years more of a digital transformation. So I do a lot of the cloud integrated networking stuff, network virtualization, um, things like that on, on a large scale is definitely my core. And then 
as networking overlaps with aspects of cybersecurity as well. So that's definitely my niche, I would say networking and kind of the security world. Appreciate that. And then just a bit of the highlight reel, just again, let me know if any of this is wrong, but yeah. uh, obviously the way that you described it is, you know, the first couple of years you was really building, you know, your patch. And then the numbers I've got down here, I've got a pound sign in front of them, but it might be dollars. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for the first, I think the first full year I've got down here, 385K dollars GP. That's dollars, yeah. Dollars, yeah, okay, so it's all dollars, nice. Okay, cool. Um, and then let's just go into more recent years, but basically every every year, you tell me, every year since the fourth year, you've done over a million GP dollars from, so yes. like from 2019 until now. Um, yeah, 2019 until now, at least one or, or over that, yeah. And then, yeah, the last two years, you've done four and a half with last year, you did 2.23 million GP. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Two, the last two years consecutively, I did over two million. So let, like, let's just get straight into it, Asher, basically. So I think what I found really interesting when we prepared for this, which is where I want us to start, um, is the way that you basically described like average performance to becoming like really, really great performance. Um, and I think the way that you described this to me and this sort of made sense in terms of like the solutions that you sell, the types of accounts that you've ended up having in terms of producing those numbers is I think you put here like average contractors, you might be doing two, three placements with a client, but where you can really level up is like the program elements to so, like be involved in the entire thing. Um, and this is really interesting because I was just saying to you that I interviewed someone uh, last week uh, who has always been involved in that contract to hire space. Um, but has been getting some opportunities to do those hiring projects, those entire programs, uh, which are obviously a lot larger in deal size, or they're a lot larger in terms of like the overall contracts that they're going to get out in certain accounts. Um, and now he's going into this uh, role where, like a bit like your job title, he's just a, a contract solution director. So now he's basically responsible for bringing in predominantly all the bit new business and uh, with a big focus on winning large scale hiring projects. So I guess my, my first thing to you, Asher, is I feel like this is coming up more and more when I speak to contract recruiters, or this is often when I speak to recruitment companies that have been doing contract and want to like level up their game. So I guess the first thing I want to start with you is, like if you were this person I just described to you has just been like promoted to, you know, this client solutions director, and they've maybe had along the way some, you know, some wins where they were involved in an entire program or a big hiring project, but it wasn't like consistent and now that's their focus. Like, talk me through like, how would you be thinking about those first 90 days? You're in that role, you're now, you know, very reliant on to, being, to be in the room or bringing in these big programs, these big hiring projects. Like, how, how would you approach being in that seat and now that being your entire focus? Sure. The, the number one thing I think that changes any contract recruiter going from being a transactional recruiter to a partner, right? And, and focusing on those large accounts and being able to kind of land and expand and do multiple placements with customers is identifying your market as early as possible. And I'm not just talking about technology niche, like I do networking, but what does that mean? What I want to identify is which companies do I have to work with in my market? which are the companies I have to work with, no matter what happens, I'm going to work with these companies because they are the ones that are winning the largest projects. They are the ones that are working with these massive blue chip companies that me as a 50 person company are, are likely not going to be able to get in with directly, but they're going to have to utilize outside partners to beef up their project teams. So identifying who are those companies, that is the number one thing. So market mapping, I think is the best way to describe it. I think people mistake that sometimes I'm in, I'm in my niche. But being, you know, having a technology that you, you focus on isn't enough, essentially. You need to know who your target audience is very early on and you need direction straight away. Um, the way you get that is doing the basics extremely well and being thorough. For me, when I came out here, I was all I was doing was speaking to contractors. That's what I want. I want to speak to career contractors, people that have their own companies, people that are 100% committed to doing projects, to doing contracts and seeing which companies they work with and identifying which companies come up time and time again, because the companies that come up time and time again are the ones that I want to work with because they're the ones that are consistently winning those projects that I want to be a part of. So for me, the most important, the 90 days is your market mapping uh, and identifying, you know, ideally you want the list to be small, right? Because 
again when it's too big we're kind of throwing a, a dart in the dark type thing for me i think my list was 15 20 companies across the us that was my non-negotiable i was going to get in with and the target was at least to get in with at least five you know maybe two of those would be massive accounts and three or four would be you know might be a mid mid size where they give me 10 or 15 placements a year so it was critical for me to map out the market and identify which companies i was going to work with and the way i did that honestly was doing the basics extremely well. I spoke to a ton of candidates, did my market research. Um, I was in my you know, speaking to people just in my space and then finding out where people were interviewing, where they had worked with, wh which companies uh, had they worked with before in the past? Was there companies that had hired them multiple times for projects and getting that information and then essentially going to those companies, doing the, the classic right selling in candidates, finding out what projects they're working on, selling in the right skills, reaching out to the right people, networking just doing the basics but i'm making sure i'm doing that with the audience that i know are going to be wanting to buy or work with me because they're in that space 100 percent. so anyone I'm, I'm reaching out to is relevant people um but also when i know that this company is the company i need to work with to be successful the motivation for me to get in there is is surpasses anything else because that is a non-negotiable for me to succeed i have to work with this company the these companies are the only way for me to get you know a hold of these projects um, for me to go ahead and get into these companies like these blue chips, like these Fortune 100 companies is through this, th these middlemen, you know, these, these value added resellers, these IT services companies that own the projects. So that was my non-negotiable. So the first 90 days is crucial for you doing that and identify who and what you're going after. And I think once you get that and you understand it's a lot more, it's a lot easier for you to go out there and attack it properly and do it intelligently as well. So I think main, main thing is people sometimes spread themselves too thin um, and they're going after anything and everything. So have a niche and then have a niche within the niche. That's the biggest thing um, as well, because with the VARs, the IT services, the culture is so important, right? I need to find a consultant that can manage a massive bank with 350,000 employees. I, I'm not going to find someone who's only done local school networks, right? So you need to understand what type of person is going to, is going to fly within these 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 large projects. You know, have they done them before? Do they they need to be resilient? They need to be you know contract heavy. They need to be rich in experience of dealing with difficult customers, difficult issues, putting out fires. So understanding that culture as well, you immerse yourself in that. You when you're sending candidates into projects, you know they are going to be they have the minerals to be able to keep up with it. You know, you're not going to send someone that's never done contracting before into one of the largest banks in the country to go and to go and work on a huge multi-million dollar re remediation project for example so there's so many elements to it but essentially that's what i would do and focus on and that's where the game kind of clicked for me and, and changed for me was when i had that focus yeah it, it definitely makes it a lot easier when you you've 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 got that target list right because then you can really focus your energy i guess actually do you might i know this might be specific to your industry but it still might be helpful for people what were some of the like core elements that made you think or that you feel like are important to hear and understand that makes a client go on your list of like, I have to work with this company. So I guess what I'm asking, like what, what is the makeup of those companies? Are you finding out from the contractors that they've worked with that business on a project like more than twice or three times? There might be more to it, but like what, what, what have you found to be the makeup that, go, that makes you go, th these hire and use contractors consistently, they've got a track record of doing it. Like if I'm gonna get yeah, at my contract, but to a really soil place, I, I need to have one of these accounts because of what I've learned. What, what's the makeup? What are the things? What's the important info? Yeah, that's 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 good to know. I think for me is obviously finding companies that, you know, are partners to much lar larger organizations and people with what I call critical infrastructure. So if you think of someone like a bank, a bank needs to ensure that their network, their infrastructure is consistently growing, evolving and all, always working. You know, you, you can't have a bank, have their network go down and then all of their customers across the country get affected. Right. So companies like that, that have essential infrastructure need ongoing projects. It's like never ending, essentially. Right. So if you can identify the companies that support those end clients, that's a big thing for me is understanding which company. So if I go and reach out to you know, one of the major banks here, you can find out who it was that was supplying the, the staff, you know, to them, who was the, the integration partner. So for me, it's about, right, wh who is the end customer? That's important because I know these end customers, if they're in the telecommunications 
industry, if they're in banking industry, financial, anything like that, broadcasting, the projects never end. You know, you have some companies like, all right, we're going to roll out a new software, bring a contract in for six months. All right, thank you on your way. These ones are, these are programs that are three to five years of consistent digital transformation. So for me, that's a big thing is finding out these companies, who is the end client? You know, and, and do, does this company, are they the exclusive integration partner of that end client? Um, you can find that fairly easily. Honestly, a lot of contractors and candidates put it on their resumes. So they might put the end client and then a slash who their, who their mm. contracting company was. So it's an easy way to essentially identify. Um, and speaking to people as well, I would speak to contractors and ask for them, hey, you know, when you worked this, did you go through someone? You know, is there a company you'd recommend I reach out to? So for me, I, I get that information from them, but I would want to ensure that these companies are real technology companies as well. The, cust the companies that I'm partnering with, a lot of the time they have two branches to their, their company, is they have their own full-time employees, professional services or in, uh, advanced services, where these employees are you know, hired by the company, they're on salary, they're on bonuses, they're 100% uh, you know, full-time and they are you know dedicated to individual customers and then from that typically you you get you breed this this different arm to the business which is specific project support and a lot of the time the permanent staff are spread too thin with day-to-day -day support you know operational support business as usual support they can't do the projects so and they can't assign those people to those projects so what they do is they come to contractors so i like working with companies that have a large base of actual permanent staff as well that I know are going to have to be able to uh, beef up those teams with contractors. Uh, I, I try, there are companies I work with that are what we call 100% consultancies who have a, a much smaller base of full-time staff and mostly what they do is they're winning projects and then staffing them. I like working with companies that have a large base of full-time employees because typically that means the programs they're on or the customers they have are much on a much larger scale. Um, and then I want to be working with partners, right? So Cisco, VMware, Arista, Juniper, you can, you can go on their website and see who are their top partners. Mm. Um, and essentially what they would do is they would, they would, you know, feed work into those partners. Um, so I'm wanting to go with the, you know, highly accredited partners directly from the source. Um, so those are typically kind of what I would look for, um, when I'm trying to find my, you know, my must have clients that I want to support essentially. Yeah. And I know we're going super technical here. So let me like repeat some of the things back to you that hopefully will mean that people are following on here, but oh, what I, what, no, no, th this is, I know for certain people, this will be like really, really helpful. Right. So I feel like the first thing that I got there is making sure that the end customer, like you said, so like the bank or uh, these types of things are companies that, you know, okay. It isn't going to be like, a, like you said, like a short term, three, six month project. We need to like one or two people to roll out this particular software. For example, your the end customer are likely going to be companies that, like you said, like they're always going to have ongoing projects. So firstly, is the end customer, um, does the end customer look like that? And um, does that make sense to have that thesis that they're always going to have things going right? And I'm assuming then these end customers are typically like larger enterprise. Uh, customers yeah. and then I've heard this a lot when speaking to contract recruiters like you said so that's the end customer but then like yeah who uh, who are their partners who are the people that you know winning these projects because um, a lot of the time they uh, they may win projects but may not be fully responsible to br like they won't have all of the the staff for these projects on their payroll they'll then leverage like an external partner for that so then like you said like targeting the, the end customer and then also you've got these partners and people that are involved in rolling out these projects or win responsibility for these roll out these projects um, that are likely going to need a consistent flow of contractors, reliable contractors that potentially you could supply to them. Is that, yes. am I getting that right? That's exactly, you bang it, yeah. <laughs> you know, mate. All right. Perfect, so, uh, honestly. Why don't we go into this then? Because this is one of my questions and I think this would be really interesting for people. So let's say we've got that, those 20 target customers, right? Um, and a lot of them might fall into like the enterprise category. You've you've already mentioned like speaking to contractors a lot. So, but let let me ask you this: like, I think a lot of people are interested in like how you crack enterprise accounts. Essentially, do you know what I mean? So, talk us through like your process of taking a dream enterprise client. One of these companies that you're like, this is non-negotiable. I have to, I have to, you know, this is one of the companies I have to work with. Like, talk us through your process of putting them on your list to landing your first meeting with them. Like. What does that look like? I know it, it might vary, but like, yeah, what, it, how, it how does that approach look like? 
yeah, def it's definitely changed, obviously, the way the times have changed, right? Um, when I first started recruitment, I could go in London and knock on a door, you know, and say, hey, <laughs> you want to work with me? Now it's obviously changed. I, I will say my principles have never changed um, in terms of my outreach. I believe that people buy from people. And I've learned that referrals and recommendations are your best way to penetrate an account. So I would reach out to people, I would say, fairly high up classic cold calling, emailing, but I'm doing so equipped with good information, right? I'm not just calling some random person. I'm making sure the people I'm calling are in my space. I'm making sure I know the areas that they focus on technology wise, maybe some of the accounts they might be working on. So when I'm calling people, I'm making sure that I've done my due diligence on their area and what's important to them, right? That's the biggest thing for me. So when I'm going into these cold calls, these cold emails, I'm doing so with good information. And I'll go out to people that I would say are pretty high level. So I think for me, I always found it easy to go up, start up mm. and then work my way down rather than just go down and work my way up. So I would go to VPs, CTOs, I would go to directors. Um, I used to, I have a lot of success with going to salespeople directly as well. So I will How identify... many people would you normally, sorry to button, but I've, yeah, how good. many, like, let's say, yeah, let's say, yeah, I'm trying to get in with Barclays. Like how many, how many like, and it might not be a set number, but like you, you're talking about, they start from up to down. But how many names would you maybe like have against like this big enterprise client that you'd, how many, yeah, how many contacts do you think? Sure. I mean, I've done everything from five to 25, honestly, even 30 okay, people. Cool. And I'll, I'll, I'll typically split it by region. So there might be someone that looks after the Northeast. So mm. I'll call, you know, call that person the Northeast and they look, all they do is look after the Northeast. So if I'm reaching out to someone in the Southeast, they might not overlap. Um, mm. so me reaching out to either one and essentially who can I get in with first, right? Who, who can I have the conversation with first? I think if you put all your eggs in one basket, that's where people have an issue. So for me, I'm spreading my risk as much as I can. I don't think there's a, there's a number I could give you with ex exact data. I can tell you it's always multiple, you know, people. Mm. Um, and I've been passed around 25, 30 different times before, but my biggest thing is I always try and keep it to direct contact with hiring managers first. I always go to direct decision makers, right? People that have the pain points, people that have are in the weeds day to day. That was my biggest thing is going to a VP of technical services, going to a VP of professional services, um, you know, going to them first and having a candid conversation with them, understanding what's the business looking like for you guys? Where are you looking to grow? Where are your pain points? Where are you struggling? Understanding all of that first and then being introduced from them to HR, to recruitment, to procurement, right? And having their, them vouch for me and push, helping me push through the process much more easily when I've got a sponsor. That's typically how I do it. I, I won't go to procurement without a sponsor, without some sort of clout from the company. Um, and I think people make the mistake sometimes that they go straight to procurement, but you understand procurement get hit up by a thousand people probably every day you're just another person to them. You need to have context. You need to have a backing. I think it's very difficult to get in any company of a large size without some type of internal recommendation, referral, introduction, even an email and copying in the VP you've been chatting with. You know, hey, Hashem told me you were the best person for me to speak to about this. I'd love to be compliant, blah, blah, blah. So for me, I always go that way. Um, and, and that's been the, the, the best way for me. Um, obviously, you know, there's trial and error. You're going to get some people tell you, tell you no. Um, what I have found is that people that are very high up actually seem to be more receptive. I don't know why. I'm not sure what that is, but I think some people are maybe afraid to reach out to someone that they would deem very senior. And then they would go for, you know, l lower level management perspective, you know, but perhaps, which is fine. I'm just saying w when you go to someone like a VP, a lot of the time they have dotted line managers, maybe eight different managers reporting to them in eight different regions, mm. right? So then I can, I can be introduced to eight people in eight regions and cover that from one introduction. I've now got eight new contacts. So yeah. for me, imagine like a spider web. If I start from the top, eventually I work my way down and I've got all these different contacts, all these different relationships that budded from, from one person at the top who simply said, Hey, speak to Asher about your business. So mm. that's, Honestly, how, how I how I did it, um, I don't think there's anything crazy or out this out the box. I think I just do that very. I'm very thorough. I follow up. I try and you know find things that are specific to their profiles. Is there anything we can relate on? You know, um, any sports team, anything like that, right? Try and be 
try and make yourself jump out a little bit when you're reaching out on email be specific be personalized don't send out an email to a thousand people with the same email and hope someone clicks okay you need to be specific with your approach and if you're dealing with people at a very high level then you you need to be worth their time so take the time to be worth their time i think is mm. is the biggest thing for me you know i i i'll sometimes email with a bit of a pun if the company has a a name where I can make a pun, I'll email with the pun or make a, a reference to a, a sporting event if they're that, that team or something. So my approach is always specific, build really good rapport, good relationships, sell myself and what, and what we can do and, and the solutions that we bring and why we're gonna be a good partner and then have them introduce me to the right people, um, the day-to-day -day managers. And then from there, the conversation with those hiring managers is extremely easy because I've been introduced by their boss. They're not gonna say no, because their mm -hmm. boss has vouched for me. So. Then I'm in, and then once that's going on, I've got the need, I can go to procurement and get become a partner through the, the proper channels because I've got the backing of a hiring manager who wants to work with me or has a, or wants to use the candidate that I have. So you have to have context, you have to have skin in the game, and you definitely have to have recommendations and referrals from networking within. Uh, without those things, in my opinion, you're never gonna be able to branch out. You're never gonna grow an account. You might have one tiny area of a business, but, um, the, the people that are lower level, uh, in my opinion, are less receptive to you know, putting their name out there for you or pushing you out just because they've got more on the line. The people at the top, for them, it is you know, it is what it is, right? Um, they have everything to gain and, and nothing really to lose if everything works out. So they're already at the top. So that's kind of what, what was my, my mindset behind it. So a couple of things here that that was really interesting how you broke that down. So the first thing I found this, I, the first thing I just want to underline, and you can let me know what you think about this, but I found this, I'm finding this time and time again when I speak to high performing contract recruiters is that they are so disciplined with their information and they take that so seriously. This isn't something where it's like, yeah, I'm not, not very good at time management. I'm not very good at, you know, keeping on top of my notes and following up like high performing recruiters view the information that they gather as absolutely non-negotiable when it comes to storing it, when it comes to listening, when it comes to, yeah, really utilizing that information because what you just said there at the beginning, which I've picked up on from people, is that when you take that seriously, the best people then really use that when they reach out to people, right? So you're reaching out to Asha, who's the VP or whatever, and you're saying, hey, Asha, look, I, I've, I've heard that you used a number of contractors between April till June last year in 2023 on this type of project uh, for this reason. Look, I may be wrong here with my information, but um, you know, what, what do I need to do for us to have a conversation to make sure that when you might run into that again or that project again, that I'm someone that um, you, know, you should be speaking to or whatever that sounds like, I might be wrong, but I feel like the information, that's when you can really showcase your credibility, right? So I don't yeah. know how you feel about that, but I just wanted to underline that because this is something I'm hearing time and time again, and this is how you can use it to really stand out and, and show people that you know your staff. Yeah, I, I think, I think you, you, what you need to do and what I've done and as I've matured in my career was I, to be fair, from the early on, I think I was always good at being personable. I think in contracting, it's all about relationships. That's all it is. You need to be very good at building relationships. To get through the door, you need to show you're knowledgeable. So exactly what you mentioned, hey, I understand you hired these people. I understand you had these projects. I know this technology is really difficult to find. We have a bunch of these guys, you know, ready to go. Do you have any more projects in the pipeline? Because these guys, you know, they're ready to go. I know you've hired for them before, you know, so that that information, even if they're not, they know I've done my due diligence. They know I know mm. what I'm talking about. And they're like, okay, this guy, clearly he's, he's done his research and he's taken the time to find out about us. I'll give him the time of day because I've, I've taken that time. and not just, hey, are you hiring? Okay, bye. You know, it's, it's, it's very, the, 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 the personal touch, the personal approach goes a long way. Um, so doing your due diligence from a technical perspective, coming again with information, hey, I know you guys are a top Cisco partner. I saw you got awarded you know, Cisco partner of the year, or you guys were, were using this tool better than anyone else. You know, just little things like that, it just goes a long way. And the other thing is being very meticulous with your notes after a conversation. Um, and all the things that you think might be small details, they're not small details. So I think I had one client and we were chatting and he, his kid just broke his leg. So it's a small, small thing, right? Just broke his leg. The budget was frozen. It was, it was a, a, a very big prospect for me. I managed to get through to him. He's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I can't chat. I've got to go. My, my son's broken his leg. I was like, okay, 
I wrote that down and we had another call. The first thing I said was, how's your son's leg? How's he doing? And then that from there, we spoke for about 45 minutes. I think about personal stuff, kids, whatever it was, we just chatted. And then five minutes of that was business at the end. And then we partnered with each other. We've been doing business ever since. So me taking the time just to write that little note down and come back to the call with something personable, something personal, went a long way to, to him, right? And obviously I've got kids, so I genuinely care how, 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 is, how is the son? You know, how, how are you doing? But I'm just saying, I think people miss it. They gloss over that. If it's not to do with business, they're, they're like, oh, that's, that's, that's not relevant. But it mm. is, it's all relevant. People buy from people that they like. And contracting is all about relationships with people, doing business consistently, repeatedly with people that you like. All of my contractors, I've got a handful, maybe 30 to 50, that I've, what we call recycled over the last eight years that reach out to me proactively. I reach out to them with information because we like each other. We trust each other. Mm. That's all it comes down to. You have the same with your clients. So everything matters and information, the technical, the market is important, but the person is is key. I think people, sometimes they, they forget that business is personable and people want to work with people they like. And, and that's it. That's a big ingredient for me, I think, throughout my career is making real relationships and, you know, and friendships, essentially, you know. We'll get back to the episode in just one minute, but today I'm excited to talk to you about one of our partners, Sourcewell, the industry leading business development and headhunting platform. At the end of last year, Sourcewell released an exciting new feature, the platform's very own live feed. Being honest with you, this feature has been one of my favorites to date because it tells you exactly who's engaging with your outreach in real time. This means you can easily tell which lead is hot and which is not, so you can connect with the right people at the right time to skyrocket your engagement. You can actually hear from one of our mentors and 2023 panelists, Amber Penrose, on how she's achieved instant results with Sourcewell's new feature, Live Feed. The Sourcewell Live List feature has enabled me to become a secret little stalker and to contact my ideal customer profile whilst they're at their desks. And especially for someone like me who works in biotech where computer time, understandably for a lot of scientists, just isn't prevalent. This has been a huge help. And for example, a biotech vice president of HR who I have been politely pestering for what feels like my entire life <laughs> finally picked up the phone to me because I cold called her after she clicked on my email four times in a row, which Sourcewell kindly had let me know. To the point where she actually giggled during my cold call opener and responded with, are you in the office watching me? <laughs> and despite that awkward encounter, we're now working on a retained project with them in Boston. And that wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for Sourcewell. As you can see, Sourcewell is a great tool for driving better engagement, more meetings and higher revenue. If you're looking for a competitive edge in 2024, then Sourcewell could be for you. You can book a demo with Sourcewell and mention the Recruitment Mentors podcast to enjoy an extra 50 phone and 50 email credits per user. And this exclusive offer for this community is going to save you circa £500 or more and is only going to be available until March the 31st. So click the link in the show notes or you can go directly to sourcewell.com forward slash demo the the second bit that i just wanted you to touch on a bit if it's okay is um you were going through it but i just want to make sure that for people listening they can maybe you know experiment with things here or try different things but like you said i really like when we're talking about enterprise accounts like how important it is to get that internal sponsor sponsor um so i guess you know i feel like what underpins all of this for example what I feel like underpins this being a successful strategy is that like if you do get a sponsor, if someone puts their neck on the line and introduces you and you get to the point of working with them, like you have to fucking deliver. Like you, you have to really you know, show what you're about. So none of this is going to work unless you actually deliver. You give them evidence of like Asher is someone that we can trust. He said that he could do this for us. He did. So like that underpins it. But I guess what I would um, like just to talk to us a bit more about is particularly if we're going at the senior end, like what what does this sound like in terms of like, how, like how do we uh, encourage these people to be a sponsor? I guess is what I'm asking. Like what what does this sound like? Are you going? Uh, are you really trying to make sure that they know that you're someone that has a track record or that they can trust as to why they're that? Or are you leading with your information again? So I'm like, hey, you know, I've, a few people told me that this is a project they have upcoming and this was an issue last time. So, you know, I'm someone that has done multiple of these types of projects. I don't know, like what, what are the typical things that you really try and, you know, discuss and communicate that makes them go, you know what, Asher, uh, 
I, I, I'm, I'm happy to introduce you. Uh, there might not be one thing, but like, what, what does that sound like? What are the things that you try and do? I think just demonstrating that I'm knowledgeable, right? Um, I think that's, that's the first thing you can do without, without adding context or actually being able to supply a candidate. All you can really do is, is prove that you know what you're talking about and be relatable. Um, it's, it's difficult to prove yourself without proving yourself in a way, right? Yeah. Without, you know, oh, here's a project, here's a great candidate, awesome, they worked out really well. Let, let me now introduce you to the rest of the team. That's probably where I've done, where I've had most success people, re, people introducing me, typically is performing really well, you know, on, on one specific role and then having them and making sure the process is perfect. My communication is perfect. Everything about it is seamless, is nothing stressful. You know, they email me, I email right back. They try and whatever they want, I'm there. So that's typically my best thing is when I get, when I, you know, I told you I, I branch out to multiple people, but when I start getting somewhere with someone, then I invest a lot of time into that person. And typically, ideally, you know, I'm speaking to people that are hiring managers. And honestly, what I've done before, I've said, what is right now, so I can prove myself, what is the most difficult thing, most difficult skill set that you are that you have? Uh, is there a particular role or a project that is in the middle of nowhere that you need to find someone from? What can I do to prove myself? And I'll ask for that and set myself up. And th the biggest thing as well is I don't over deliver. I never have promised something that I know I can't deliver on. And I think that's gone a long way as well, where I had some, you know, we, we tried to work on them on something and the budget just it just wasn't right skill set wasn't right location wasn't right so the honesty was there as well um i i think it is situational because some people i'm working i'm speaking to are direct hiring managers so i get the chance to maybe deliver to them directly and then they're more comfortable opening opening up to the peers if it's someone who is more high level and they they're not really hiring directly but their their managers beneath them are then for me it's all about market intel improving proving my knowledge talking about the market um you know the trends in the market um, maybe having references I can refer companies I've worked with, showing projects I've you know given examples of my work, that kind of stuff, um, and adding some good context where they feel comfortable enough to then introduce me to other people. So I would say it's two answers: either I have the ability to work and actually provide an actual project resource and do really well on that, and then and then ask them once we succeed to open it up, or if they're not a direct hiring manager, then I just prove it as much as I can um, by information references references to work, projects we've done, customers we supported, success cases, that kind of stuff. That's typically yeah. what I'll do. Okay, that, 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 make, that makes sense. Um, I guess, like, curious to get your thoughts on this then, Asher. Like, when you think about the, like, sales process, when you think about being in the room when, you know, Oscar's being considered as a program partner or a lot, like, whatever the terminology is, like, does, does the sales process look different um, if it was, like, the typical contract to hire stuff. The, the reason why I'm asking this is because I feel like whenever I speak to people um, when they're on this journey of wanting to win like the bigger projects, like you do have to like rethink your sales process in the sense that for you to even get to that point of being considered, like you do need to be having these meetings around like the wider commercials of like what are the issues, like where, where are we going here, like why is this project important? If we don't have the people on this project delivering, what's the consequences of that, right? You know, that isn't going into um, a conversation going like, oh, do you need someone with React experience? Yeah, I've got loads of them. Do you know what I mean? And jumping straight into that. Like, is that something that you've had to evolve over time as well? Because I feel like from my conversation I had with people, it, it does require a different sales process and a different approach. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, um, I think it depends who you're speaking to. Again, I think if I look at my sales process, I think I have certain things that are my non-negotiables that we cover. But some, I think the thing you mentioned is what I call reactive recruitment, right? Hey, you need a react person. All right, I've got someone. Great. Solution selling is is the difference, and the sale. I don't think the sales process is, is necessarily different. Okay. But you're covering different avenues. You know, you're still doing. You still have your beginning, middle, end. You still have the end goal. But if you're if you're working with professional services managers, all they care they're just reactive. They have projects that need people. What if we have? If you're working with a solutions practice manager where they're going in and they're hiring people to sit down with customers and help them redesign an entire infrastructure, then you need, you need, you, you need thoughtful people. You need 
thinkers and you're essentially going to be selling in an entire program. So I think it really just depends on the person you're speaking to and what their needs are is where I, is where I would change it. I think what you need to be able to do as a good contract recruiter is be able to do all aspects of contract recruiting and sell in every single different way very confidently. I think the issue is people are very good at reactive selling, but they don't understand the solution side. They don't understand long-term strategy. They're just thinking about now, let me get someone in and then let me go on to the next. I think you've got to look at the bigger picture. If a company goes... If a, if, a, if a technology company goes to work with a large bank again and the bank, all they need to do is they want them to host their data center, what that company should be doing is, all right, let's first start with the data center and then we can lead from that into getting all of their software projects and do all of their do their websites and, and do their applications. And from there, we can do the testing and then we can look at their AI and their ML and, and looking at all of that, right, looking at the whole picture. So I think for me, my fact finding, the questions I would ask would be different and when I identify if this person is going to be a reactive partner of mine, where they just want me for transactional recruitment or they wanting, you know, the bigger picture, the, the long, the longer scope, then my, my process would change slightly, but more in my approach, you know, and the kind of questions I'm asking and then the, the, the people that I'm giving to them. But I think the nuts and bolts of it are your foundation stays the same throughout, um, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, but, that does. I'm going to put you on the spot then. Yeah, go on. Do you mind? Because <laughs> I, under, I understand what you're saying. It's the questions that you ask, the fact finding. So that's what I'm going to put you on the spot on. Like, give us an example of like, if you speak to someone that, yeah, you understand is a lot more reactive, like needs skill set, they've got issues. It's just more of like time to delivery or time to just get someone in. Like, what does like one or two fact find questions typically sound like there compared to you speak to someone that, like you said, there's a bit more of a larger scope and, um, it's more about like where they're going and like the wider pictures. So, like, what? Give us some examples. Yeah, of so the if, it, if, it's, if it's reactive, I'm like, essentially, I'm asked. The first thing is, what's the project? What's the need? Mm. Why do you need this person? And it's like, okay, we're doing we're doing a VMware upgrade, for example, and we don't have the expertise with the NSX or something like that. So for me, that's essentially the, the biggest thing for me is asking why. Why do we need this person? How urgently do we need them? You know, how big is the team? Where's the skill gap right now? Are we just filling a skill gap, or is this person going to come in and train everyone else? Those are my questions I would ask for reactive consulting, mm -hmm. essentially. And then from there, I guess if I'm on the on the solution side, I the biggest thing for me is what's what's the long term goal here? You know, mm -hmm. are we what are we looking to achieve? You know, are we looking to save money? Are we looking to clear some technical debt? Are we potentially going to be going through an acquisition? For me, the, the question would be what's the long term goal and understanding where they're trying to get and what they're trying to achieve why and how and how these people are going to change that and what type of people they don't have right now why they don't think the people in their roster right now can get them to that point and why do they need to go there so for me i think the why is is honestly the question i ask mostly and that question kind of leads on to the spider of, of, of yeah. other ones nice that, no that brings it to life so that, that that's really uh, helpful i think something that'd be interesting then because again i'm sure you've thought about this because you sound it sounds like you've been like over time just a lot more strategic with the types of accounts you want to bring on and, and these types of things so again feel free to correct me if i'm wrong here but just to frame up this question so i think this might have been like last year when you had one of your um you know big issues i think what was in terms of like the spread because i think that's often what people are interested in and like if, if ash is doing over two million in gp dollars like how many clients does he have and these types of things right and i think this this sort of feeds quite nicely into what we've just been talking about and you know how you've been able to produce the numbers that you have but um on here i've got um the spread looked like you had six um core different customers one very large customer and five solid repeat customers is that right yeah. like one company you've been doing business with for over for like seven years yeah. um so that that's quite interesting right and is that is that right that's like the core elements that like make up you know your contract book and what that looked like has that has that like changed over time or is it always when you've done your like best years has it been has it sort of looked like that in terms of like six to maybe eight core cool customers and then you maybe have one two very large ones is, is that fair or like what yeah. what's like the makeup look like yeah i think that that's essentially been my the last 10 years so just before i came out to the us um where i was strong at and where i'm good at is large accounts and growing those accounts and growing those relationships and managing them um, and being consistent and never letting the quality drop. Because I think 
with, with I, I had, I, I'm, I'm not the best, I would say, I'm not the best cold caller. I'm not the best at spot business, essentially. Um, you know, people who don't know what that means, it's calling someone up, doing a, you know, doing a quick placement, moving on to the next one, having 50 different clients. I was never the best at that. I think I recognized earlier on the relationships were my, my way forward. And I, I think some people would say, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Uh, or you put in too many, you know, one eggs and not in, in too few baskets. But the thing is, if you're going after these large enterprise companies, they almost have like 10 different companies within the company. You know, you have different business units. You have some, a company that just does the banking sector, a, a company that just does um, the, fun, uh, the, the telecom sector, the healthcare sector. So if you can get in with all of those, essentially you're kind of working with 10 different clients with it under one umbrella. And I think it's identifying those companies that have different business units, and I can work with all of those, where having one company isn't the same as having one large client and one contact. I have one large mm. client and about 50 different contacts at the client. You know, I work with mm. pretty much every aspect of that client. So yes, I think the spread that you are absolutely right, but I think the context is important that it's, I think some people where they get, where they, where they get clocked maybe is they have one really great client, but they only have one contact. And when that mm. contact leaves, that there's they they're building from scratch, and they a lot of the time if the person takes over has their own relationships, you're left in the dark. So for me, what I'm very good at, I think, is growing out the account and having multiple different relationships and managing each relationship like it's its own company, it's its own it's its own sub company in a parent company. And then I think what's really important as well is having those those mid clients, right? The ones that come to you consistently, you work with them. You know, my other clients I mentioned, I've been working with for at least four or five years. And then I've got newer customers who the, the company name is new, but the manager contact is not. You know, they've mm. moved from my old client and they brought me into their new company because of relationships I've had. So really, I've worked with one company consistently for about seven or eight years, but I've worked with different contacts that have left that company. They brought me on and I've maintained the relationships with the other company while growing the new mm. companies as well and going through that way. So for me, I think volume, I've managed to grow out the volume, but I'm, I'm not spread too, too crazy, right? Having 25, 30 different customers, I'm, I'm focused on the quality and growth of these, these smaller groups mm. where I can really control the outcomes and ensure that my relationships last no matter who leaves and who, who comes and goes. I can still work with this company. Mm. So that's kind of been my focus. And I, you know, I, I was going after the first few years of my, of my career, I was honestly just just trying to get as many. Com I thought as many companies as I can, but I was I, I, I couldn't I couldn't build proper meaningful relationships. Um, and I, I thought, and for me, it just was I'm just not a spot business guy. So we'll get back to the episode in just one minute. But today, I'm excited to talk to you about one of our partners, Firefish, the recruitment CRM that accelerates data driven growth. Being able to benchmark your agency's performance against others in your industry has always been impossible until now. Our partners at Firefish have just recently released their industry benchmarking dashboards, taking data insights to the next level by enabling you to benchmark your own performance, your recruiters and team's performance against others within your sector. The benchmarking dashboards are built on anonymized placement, sales and KPI data, so Firefish users can get a monthly snapshot of their agency's performance benchmarks against their peers in seconds. If you want to learn more about benchmarking dashboards or find out how Firefish can support your company's growth this year, they very kindly offered our community, the Recruitment Mentors Podcast, a special offer that's gonna save you thousands of pounds. Now this offer is only available until March the 31st, so you can click the link in the show description or you can head to firefishsoftware.com forward slash RMP. Well, I think this was gonna be my next thing, which you've sort of just been going through, but I've interviewed people in here, contract recruiters who had that maybe fell into that trap of like, I've got this one huge client, had an absolute mega year, like had a ton of placements that year. Uh, but like you said, it was one huge client, but also one contact. Um, and then next year something happened and their contract book got like slashed in half. Obviously that's not always the, the reason, but my next thing that I was gonna ask you, which I feel like you're just touching on was like, yeah, how, cause I think I'm sure you've been around people where like, they got their weekly GP up to 20, 25K, and then they had a moment where that went down to fucking 10K or, or 5K because one client cut like a huge project or whatever. 
But it seems like, you know, with your track record, I'm sure there's been some moments where you've been like, fuck, they're cutting all these contractors. Um, and then there's some, been those up and downs. But really, if you look at your track record, it's been like consistent, right? Um, and I feel like you, you've had to be really smart with how you future proofed your book. Um, and I feel like this is what you're touching on. So this is what I was going to ask you on, like, you know, how does Asher think about protecting his book, right? From going from, again, yeah, like you could, like, because it's that word complacency, isn't it? Like that, that's what you could easily creep in for you. So how, I feel like you're just touching it, but how do you think about protecting your book from having those big hits um, and then you're starting from scratch? Sure. So s mitigating the risk by spreading the relationships to ensure that you're supporting all the different markets out there. Right. And that's what I mentioned. I said that the companies you work with, they have different, like almost different businesses within the business. When you go through recessions or, you know, um, layoffs and things like that, if you look at it, typically it's certain industries. Some industries uh, get affected and some thrive. If you look at COVID, for example, a lot of industries struggle, but some absolutely thrive. Like during COVID, I think it was hospitality, food, drink. I mean, it was probably the worst time to be in that industry. But. Mm. IT communications, anything to do with anything virtual, anything to do with, you know, Zoom, all of these hosting, they absolutely thrived, right? So understanding where the market's going and being able to be flexible enough to follow that market and double down on the areas of market where it's going. For, I think stocks are a good example I could probably use. You know, I have a stocks account and my spread is 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 a quite a wide spread. It's across many different industries. When the oil and gas industry is doing really well, I'm doubling down there, but keeping mm. still keeping a good trickle in, in, in you know, in, in tech and telco and things like that. And then as it starts to shift, I bring it out and I go back again. So it's just about ensuring you're staying on top of the market, seeing where the trends are going, but ensuring that you don't do all or nothing. I think people do that like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to, all I'm going to do is manufacturing because that's really heavy right now. And then you essentially forget about telecoms and you've done nothing there. And then manufacturing goes down and slows down and telco goes up. All the relationships are gone because you left it and now other people are capitalizing. So ensuring that you've got an insurance blanket, you know, spread across all the different markets as much as you can. I think that's helped me kind of stay afloat um, and being flexible, moving with the times and ensuring that I understand where it's going. Um, and the way you do that is, by, is obviously you get your information, you're speaking to people. Um, but having those relationships in place and keeping in touch. I have relationships where they haven't been able to hire for 15 months. I still, we still chat regularly. I still treat them like they're my, you know, that they're my buying client. They just can't right now, but they might in a year, they might in six months, they're going to call me eventually. So that relationship is key. I think people, what they do is they follow the money where it is at the time and it's all present. They're not looking at the long term, the future. They're just looking at it right now and they put these, these, um, what they call the uh, blinders on. Yeah, you know, yeah. and they're just there and then that's gone. And then they've, they've forgotten about this whole pipeline. So for mm. me, I think what I've done well is I've, I've made sure my future pipeline is consistently growing. My relationships are staying consistent and up to date all the time so that when this market goes like this, my relationship mm. come back and it's, it's all there and I'm staying relevant. That's, I think what yeah. I've done, what I'm proud of, and I think I've done well, um, is just ensuring that. And I think people feel it as well. If you're like, Oh, where have you been for the last 12 months? I haven't heard from you. Now, now the market's good. You want to reach out. P people know what you're doing, you know? So it, those, those things go a long way. Um, and I think that had a, a positive, a really good positive effect on me that I didn't, you know, disregard any relationship just because the market wasn't going to allow them to spend loads of money with me right now. But instead they could spend loads of money with me in a year and a year from now, that money is still going to be extremely important to me and, and relevant, right? Because, mm -hmm you know, that, that business, you know, whatever it is. So I think people need to have that long-term vision. And I think too many people have too short term too just present only, um, and not thinking about the bigger picture and then they get caught, you know, uh, in, in what you, what you've seen, you know, and so look, there are things that are unforeseen. You might've done everything well and you have a client who just shuts his doors or gets acquired or they just, you know, they lose a contract. You see that happen all the time that happens. Um, but, if that happens and all of your contractors go and you've got nothing else, then you haven't done enough, you know, critical planning in, in my, in my opinion. Um, and you, you haven't thought about what could go wrong. 
I think that's sometimes thing, you know, not to be negative, but you've got to think, all right, what happens if this goes? Do I have other relationships? You know, where can I go? Am I going to be starting from scratch? And just ensuring that no matter what happens, you're never going to be starting from scratch and you've always got a base level to build off. Um, that's, I think, what I've done is just maintain a consistent level of relationship, of communication with those people to ensure that as the market goes, you know, mm. so, so does that. And I, I'm never caught left with nothing, essentially. So. Mm. It's interesting, right? Because it, lo- it like sort of loops back around, like you said at the beginning of that, like the information, right? You're going to be yeah. making those smart decisions if you're listening, you're asking good quality questions, you're being diligent with your information that you're getting. Um, but no, that, that's really helpful. So I guess, like, as we round out here then, like, talk, talk, talk to me about, like, you've been in this game for a long time. Like, clearly you, you think about what you do in a strategic way, methodically. Like, how, when I say to you, like, what has... What has uh, Asher had to continue to really focus on when it comes to his craft? Like, how do you feel? Like, how have you? I feel like you've mentioned principles a lot. I think you gave me the the analogy when we prepared for this. Like, you can't just rely on the protein shake to get big, right? You got to eat correctly. You got to stay consistent. So I'm just curious. Like, when someone's done it for as long as you had, you've you know you've had some consistent high performing years. Like, what's your mindset towards like what do you what have you really had to remain sharp with and and focused on you might say relationships again but like what have you really had to stay focused on and make sure show up show up every single day that you do to make sure that like you said you don't find yourself in a situation where you're like fuck i dropped my ball i dropped the ball there and i've now paid the price i am a big believer if it ain't broke don't don't fix it my processes work for me so i follow my processes on everything right the same candidate you know, candidate qualification, candidates, resume, my formatting, they'll, my company team will tell me they'll send me a resume and I'll reject it. If it doesn't, if it's not uniform, I'm not sending it. You know, I'm, I'm like that though. Like I've made sure that from the beginning I'm uniform in everything I do. And I, and I've stayed with that uniform. I've stayed with that code of conduct that's made me successful. And I stick to that every day. I don't differ or stray from the path. I do the basics and I, I use that again. My team are probably going to hate me saying this because I, I drill it to them all the time but I, I don't stray away from my foundation and I didn't forget what made me, you know, what made me good in the first place was like my first company, they would cane me with KPIs, man. And I'd be like, Oh, what is this? But now I get it because it made, it made me made sure that repetition just became, you know, automatic, you know, it was a reflex. So I do all the same things meticulously. Right. And I follow my process like a uniform. My resume submissions are always the same. The, the resumes look tight. There's no typos. It's a uniform. Um, I don't stray too far away from the path, double down on the areas when I'm getting success. Uh, always be willing to learn and to listen, I think, as well, has been a big thing for me, understanding that I'm not always, even if I've got 12 years experience, someone with two years experience could be, you know, could be could be right. It's, it's sometimes a tough pill to swallow, but... I think my, my biggest thing, honestly, to summarize and not go too far for the, the answer is just sticking to my, my principles and my foundation um, and, and hitting the basics really, really well. You know, making sure when we speak to a candidate, we hit all of the interview questions that we need to ensure that they're a viable candidate. Never panic send anyone. I would rather not send a candidate than send three shitty candidates. That's a, I am massive on that. I would rather send no one than, than hit and hope my brand is on the line and I protect my brand and my reputation at all costs. So I've never done anything that I'm not, I'm not sure of. I've never put someone in the mix that I'm not, that I haven't been diligent with. I haven't taken, you know, too many crazy risks. If, if someone was like, ah, 50, 50, I'll just throw them in and see what happens. I'd never do that ever. I'd honestly rather not send someone. I think me sticking to those principles has helped me maintain a level of quality because clients appreciate that way more. If they come to me with something and I can't do it. I tell them, hey, I can't do this. This is not in my remit. We don't have anyone. I've never, I, I don't overpromise, under deliver. I stick to what I'm good at, double down in those areas, triple down, you know, if, if I need to, essentially. Um, and, you know, adapt with the times a little bit with the technology stuff. But I think, no matter, you know, 20 years, 30 years, I think the foundations of recruitment will always be the same. You know, the same way you build a house, you need a good structure first. And I think for me, that structure is, hasn't changed essentially in, in 10 years. Um, and I think it's important for people to have their uniform and have a, a, a really good code, right? Uh, a formula that they follow and they can easily teach to people as well so their team can become successful. 
So I know it's a bit of a long-winded answer, but honestly, that's... No, because what, what I hear there as well is, is like the, like you've, a big part of, whenever I have these conversations, when people have performed at a high level for a consistent amount of time, it is, yes, doing those things that you mentioned, showing up, doing them, uh, and sticking to them, but also not letting your standards slip is like the other elements of that, right? You've really, you've maintained your standards, like you said, like, and that's just as important as well as showing up every day and treating those contractor calls as if, like, you've just started out, you're asking those important questions, you know, you have to, you're not getting complacent, but then you're also really maintaining those standards and holding yourself to those standards. Um, and if you do that for a long enough time, over a long period of time, you build a reputation, you build repeat customers, and that's something that you can, like you just said, build a repeatable process around. It's just about sticking to it, which is a lot harder uh, than it sounds. Um, well, I think, actually, I think... Well, I don't know. It's hard because I always have this argument with my wife. I'm someone I just get up and I'm like, just do it, you know, and it can be opposite there. But I think people make it harder than it needs to be, in my opinion. I think people overcomplicate what we do. Um, I think your the foundation, the basics have to be the strongest thing that you do. And yet that has to be air, watertight, air, you know, that has to be just perfect, essentially, right? And then on top of that, like we mentioned with the protein shake, you can do your extras. You can go out networking and, and do your, you know, join the groups and, and do Twitter and do all those cool stuff, which is, will help you grow. But the, if your foundation is weak, all those things won't matter. It doesn't matter. If you can't deliver, then, you know, you only, a lot of the time you only get one chance. Okay. Most clients, maybe they'll give you two max, but you can do all that stuff. If you don't have a good process, you don't have a good product, which is everything. I think as well, people have what they do, one thing I've noticed is people have a pedestal where they put the client first over the candidate, which is crazy to me. It's a 50, 50 partnership. The candidate, the contractor is everything. They are your product essentially, right? They are, they represent you in your name and you, and you want to ensure that what you're putting out there is as perfect as, as you can get it. And understanding that the candidate and the contractors that you have are equally as important as the clients that are buying from you is your first step to understanding the formula of being successful in contracting. Um, and never, I, I tell everyone, don't ever promise, oh, I'll have five resumes to you by the end of the day. Don't say stupid shit for the sake of it, right? That's not impressive to anyone. But what they care about is that you're delivering. So never sacrifice, you know, sounding good for actually being good um, and, and be stick to your guns and, stick and, and commit on what you know you can deliver on. Um, don't stray away from those things and I think people will be fine. Um, but that's what I've done. I'm very strict with my team, man. I, I make sure, honestly, we're uniform. If they don't, if they get off the phone and ask, I've had people, I've had someone call a candidate four times in a row. I'm like, go and get it. You know, I will do it. It's repetition because I, without that information, you clearly, you, you need to know your product inside and out. If you're selling a car, they, you know, they need to know everything, right? It's the same thing you need, about the people with the personality. What have they done? How do they deliver? It's not just what have they, how they, how much money have they saved people in the past? Where are their strengths? All of it. When they ask me questions, I don't want to have to go, oh, let me let me call them back. I'll let you know. I, I know everything about that person. Mm -hmm. So that's for me coming down from those meticulous things, having a good uniform and following that process always. Stick to that. And honestly, I don't see why no anyone couldn't be successful in contracting, to be honest. Actually, there we go. That's our, our masterclass on BD, the important <laughs> standards basics. Uh, Ash, thank you so much, mate. And, and you know... Kudos to everything that you've built, mate. Like, I think to do what you've done for a long period of time, consistently showing up, um, I think says a lot about you, what you're about. Um, so, yeah, like, amazing work, mate. And, and thanks for coming on the pod. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it, dude. <laughs>